Hey, hey guys, welcome to my game deving adventure. Do you like to game? Do you like to dev? Do you like to listen to someone talk about game deving? Well, hold on to your peripherals because I've got another Jail Tactics devlog. So because I've been obsessing over game programming for months, I can't honestly do anything but another video on my programming adventure. A major theme when digging a little deeper into programming is design patterns. So these are solutions to common problems that the community kind of agrees is a good solution to that problem. Now, even if you don't agree or are not planning on using them, they are probably still worth learning. For one, it'll sound really good if you've ever asked what a flyweight pattern is in an interview. But more importantly, you'll learn a common problem in your industry and a common solution for it. So if you ever come across this problem or see it in someone else's code, you'll have a jump start on understanding what's going on. So I thought it'd be best to get familiar with a few. If we just Google popular game dev patterns, you'll see a list of patterns from a gameprogrammingpatterns.com site. And if that domain has anything to go by, it's probably a pretty good list to start with. So the first one is command pattern, and it's an interesting one. The problem here is that you have a list of actions that you may need to perform, and you have to remember them all in case that you need to redo something or undo something. Think of replays or perhaps strategy games where you can undo your last few actions. In my game, I wanted the movement phase to not be finalized till the player indicates that they liked this spot. This comes out of my days of playing Final Fantasy Tactics where you have to choose the spot you wanted before you could flick through the attacks in the various ranges. This leads to the annoying need to preemptively know your target and attack, then count the squares to make sure that you're in the best spot. So in my game, you can freely wander around this area until you either wait or attack. Now down here, you can see the actual move logic that I was using. In my player manager, I set this form level var to have a list of grid positions and then update, we move towards the current one in the list. Now this was great to get the player moving around quickly, but frankly, I no longer care about the player. I need everyone to be able to do this. You're not special. So we bring over this function into a new script that's shared among anybody that's in the battle. And it does pretty much the same thing where it sets a form level variable and updates it in the update. But to implement the command pattern, I call set path that goes into my invoker, where we have two queued lists of commands. One's a buffer, commands that are yet to be done, and history, commands that have been already done. On the update in here, we do the command if there's still one in the buffer, and we undo one if they click the left mouse button. If we have a look at the command object, it's just an interface with an execute and an undo. And if we go back to where we added the command, we can see the actual object is just this little class that calls move on grid when executing and revert when undoing. You could have all kinds of logic in here that waits its turn in the queue to execute, like this function called face, where I make the player face the direction they are walking. This obviously has to wait until they actually have a destination before knowing where to face. Another benefit, as I mentioned before, is the history list. So I can easily walk around the move area and then do this, and then walk around and then do this, and then walk around and do this. I'm sure there are more benefits that will materialize later as well, but I suppose those will just be little gifts for future Dylan. Okay, so the next on the list is the flyweight pattern. The problem it's trying to solve is that the need to instantiate a ton of similar objects that you can't afford the hit to performance. Think of games where the bullets are actual projectiles or factory games. This is very similar to the MVC pattern, if anybody is familiar with that, or scriptable objects in Unity actually follow it. Basically, you're just using a model to store the data that is actually different between the objects, while all the similarities can stay in one object that you clone. The only use case I can think of in my game might be the enemies, or maybe the attacks themselves, but honestly there won't be a lot of any one thing since I'm not doing a looting system or anything like that. I'll keep you posted if I do end up using it anywhere. Next is the observer. I do use and love this pattern. This is a very common pattern in the enterprise world, so I'm quite familiar with it already. The problem here is that you have some sort of event that triggers things all over your program and you don't want to couple everything together. Let's have a look at my code and see a few examples. If I take a look at my grid manager, you can see that I'm registering for three events here. Camera stop, 
so I have the camera moving all over the place and I don't want anything to happen while the camera is in movement so the stomp is an event that a bunch of things can handle. Attack end, which obviously you'll need to continue on with the game after the attack animation is done, but also since that ends your turn in the my game there are a few other things that need to happen. Lastly is change game mode, and this is a big one for my game. What I mean by mode is whether we are currently exploring around or we're battling it out. So this transition here where we switch to grid movement, almost everything needs to know about this. Enemies need to stop moving, player needs to lose the exploration control, the camera needs to swing in and the grid needs to be created. So we declare an event, which is a delegate, a word that might pop up when talking about this kind of stuff. We are using a type action, which is shorthand for a delegate with no return value. If you do want to return value, then you can use funk, but that gets pretty messy pretty quick, so I would avoid using them if possible. Now that we have it declared, we can invoke it in the part of the code where it happens. I have a function aptly called change game mode, and you can see here that I'm doing a null check with the question mark, and then using the events built-in function invoke. That fires off all the functions that are registered to it. You can see here that there are a few, so let's go back to the grid manager where you can see I added it as if I were incrementing an integer. This is a function that I'm adding. If I hold control to turn this into a link, we can shoot down to where it's actually just a regular function. You can add any function with the same signature to it. Last thing is just to unregister anytime you register. This is just good practice so that something doesn't get called twice. So I've burnt all my time rambling about code, but I do hope my point comes across, even if you're not a programmer. It can be very valuable to go check out the problems and the solutions that people in your industry have come across. And that's all these patterns are, really. So go check out the rest of the list and maybe even implement a few into your project. I promise we'll talk way more about my game in my next video. I may even become funny again. So hit that like, subscribe, call me out for being a nerd in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.